When we became something that overnight was this new thing, we were over eight years into our career. You know, eight years of, of like I said, you know, loading our own gear, driving our own selves, doing five sets a night, uh, five nights a week in places like Little Rock, Arkansas, playing till four in the morning with literally no one in there, but they'd still make us play in case somebody came in, those kind of gigs. And we did, we slugged that kind of stuff out year after year after year. And everybody thought we were idiots for doing it. They really did. They thought we were crazy for, you know, why are you putting yourselves through this? It's serious uh, dedication, no doubt about it, to make something happen. But when I was young and that hungry, and we had that goal and we didn't care, we just wanted to get that record deal. When that's driving you that hard and you love music that much that you can't turn it off, you just have to do it, that can, that can get you through a lot of bad times. We were big fish in a small pond before we got a record deal. You know, in certain places we could fill up clubs and we, you know, thought we must be pretty hot. You know, we, you know, people really love us and all this stuff. And then you get a record deal. You know, the thing you've been wanting to get all this time. And you sort of stop doing the kind of gigging you were doing to make a living. Instead, you have to now treat it in a different way and sell it as a, a product. We couldn't do cover gigs to make money and be taken seriously if we were going to be in this new game, you know. So we went from the top of a small world to the very bottom of a very big world, which meant you know, very little gigging, very little money, doing opening slots where the record company had to put up money to afford for you to be out there doing it, you know, which is normal business, uh, people don't realize. It was a different world where we meant absolutely nothing to anyone all of a sudden, and we just got a record deal. So it's the opposite of what you think in your head when you get a record deal. So it, all it did for us is made us realize, man, we have got to fight all over again in a different ball game. And we don't mean anything. And a record deal doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't. Uh, it doesn't solve your problems. You still have to get out there, do the work, and make it happen, one way or another. And so that slap of realization was a good one, but uh, not what I was expecting. Because the struggling started all over again on a new scale and, and was tough for a long time yet, you know. Uh, with King's X before we started actually seeing any kind of anything coming in that had anything to do with money. Before we were called King's X, we were called The Edge for several years, but it's the same band, just different name. We found out that there were a lot of other bands in the country called The Edge, so we changed our name at a certain point. We couldn't come up with a name we liked, and uh, it was a horrible name choice, but for a very brief time, we called ourselves Sneak Preview, and we did an album during that time that a lot of people don't know about, and I really don't like pointing people to that fact because it's a terrible record. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the worst. And the cover, um, you know, God bless whoever it was that took the time to paint it and, and, and put themselves into it and everything. Uh, it's not their fault. They did what they were asked to do. Basically, here we were with boxes of albums, and we're all happy, and <laughs> we open it up, and we take a look at this album, and we... The only thing I remember is somebody saying, we cannot sell this to anybody, you know, we can't. And we were like, oh crap, what are we going to do with these then, you know? So we, what we would do is, first five people on the dance floor get a free album, you know, and we'd like toss them like frisbees out there just to get somebody to dance. It was such a bad album and looked so bad that on one of those days coming back from one of those shows where we were throwing the albums out and, and being silly, we started joking about what are we going to call our next album. and. At the time, we had uh, a guy who was doing sound sometimes and uh, roadieing with us named Kevin Morning, one of the funniest human beings I've ever known in my life. And uh, he just very sarcastically and, you know, smart, but he just says, you ought to call it next one Gretchen Goes to Nebraska. 
you know, just as the worst thing he could possibly think of for an album title. And uh, we just looked at each other and started cracking up laughing. I remember immediately looking at Jerry and Doug and eyes kind of, you know, the realization of, we will have an album called Gretchen Goes to Nebraska someday. And we thought about doing it for the first album, but we thought, well, that's just a little too far. So after the first album got a little bit of no notoriety and we got on the cover of a few magazines in Europe and people are starting to take notice, we go, let's do an album called Gretchen Goes to Nebraska now. And we just started cracking up about it and did it. And um, Jerry wrote this whole story that kind of made it become this real thing and uh, took on a life of its own. But it honestly started as a joke, as the worst possible album title anyone could think of. And that's what it takes to be an album title name for us sometimes. <laughs> I think we had a clue when we finished that one and the record label had heard it and a couple of people we trusted in England that that had put us on the cover of magazines and stuff. After we got some feedback from some of them and even before it, when we were doing the album, I remember really believing we were really stretching ourselves to uh, come up with something new and sonically in every way, you know, every sound on it, we wanted to be something different. I remember at times sitting around the studio, like throwing a wrench or something into a pile of mic stands leaned a certain way against some metal object to get one certain clank until it was like, that's it, that's the sound. And then, you know, we put it where we wanted in the song. I mean, we were doing stuff like that, where we're just dying laughing and, and you know, Doug, poor Doug, it was driving him crazy because Doug uh, likes to get in, get out, nobody gets hurt. Don't waste any time. Just let me sing it once and go home, please. For me, it was like a dream come true in the studio, like doing a Beatle album with George Martin where, where nothing is against the rules. You know, that situation you always wish you had and somebody's actually paying for it and asking for it. It was a dream come true for me. I loved doing that record. I will always think it's one of the most special things we ever did, uh, creatively, sonically. Yeah, I had a feeling we were on to something when we did that one and that things would change for us and, and that was the, where, where things changed.